Shalom, everyone. It's David Drapkin here, letting you know that the team at Psychedelic Today have launched a brand new course. It's called Navigating Psychedelics, Jewish Informed Perspectives on Psychedelics. The course merges together the best of our Navigating Psychedelics Masterclass interviews with a brand new curriculum and new teaching team focusing on the cultural, phenomenological, mystical, and spiritual aspects of Jewish psychedelic use. Over the course of nine weeks, our group of students will meet live every Tuesday alongside myself and the guest instructor of the week. Instructors include Dr. Ido Cohen, Madison Margolin, Rabbi Zach Kamenet, and Natalie Ginsberg. Students will also join a private online community to continue the learning and networking after completing the course. You don't need to be Jewish to enroll in this course, by the way, folks. It's open to both clinicians and wellness practitioners seeking advanced cultural competence, as well as non-practitioners that are interested in the intersectionality of psychedelic consciousness with Jewish spirituality and contemporary cultural and psychological experiential Jewish realities. To find out more and to enroll, please visit psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Hey, it's Joe here letting you know about two new classes coming up that Kyle and I are producing in person. So if you're in Miami or near Denver or are willing to travel, check these out. So we've been teaching Navigating Psychedelics for a long time and we decided to come up with a two-day format where you still get all of the online training for Navigating Psychedelics, but you get two different eight-hour class days with us in person. So if you want to check out the Miami dates, it's October 7 and 8 and uh, in Denver, November 10 and 11. Uh, For Denver again, November 10 and 11. And that's going to be really fun. So check out our website, psychedelicstoday.com slash events if you want to learn more about those classes and hope to see you in class. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a vital psychedelic conversation. Uh, this is our first ever podcast, I'm pretty sure, uh, with Cyprus, Brazil, and Israel being represented. So it's awesome to be here. I've just landed in Israel, and uh, yeah, I'm here with Jasmine Verdi and Tabitha Gurk, um, having a wonderful conversation, I'm sure. So um, I think a nice place to start is welcome. It's just awesome to be here. We've had a lovely chat the last 20 minutes. Uh, Jasmine, we know you quite well. You've written for us. You've taught for us. Um, do you want to introduce yourself to folks and let people know a wee bit about you? Yeah, yeah, I can do. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so my name is Jasmine. And like David said, I'm currently in Cyprus, which is where I was born, although my family is from all over. I'm Indian, Cypriot, Italian, British. And uh, I also live in Mexico, usually. So I'm, um, I'll be heading back there in a month or so. Um, yeah, since we're doing decolonized intros, um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I love roller skating and um, the ocean. Um, I have been writing for psychedelics today for at least three years. Um, and I also... Um, facilitate study groups on their vital program. Um, I work broadly in the psychedelic space. I just finished my master's in transpersonal psychology. Um, I I wrote my thesis on psychedelic peer support at both festivals and in remote contexts, focusing on self-care practices, which we can also maybe talk about later. And um, yeah, I, I've been working in psychedelic peer support for the last couple of years with Fireside Project, which I believe there is a podcast about, so that can go in the show notes. And um, yeah, I, you know, I, I deeply believe in the power of these medicines and plants and have been on a path, a medicine path for the last 10 or so years now and so I feel really honored and privileged to be able to yeah just just share some of the the knowledge that I've gathered over these years with you here today thank you Jasmine welcome yeah it's awesome having you and uh Tabitha would you like to yeah introduce yourself to everyone I think this is your definitely your first time on the Psychedelic Day podcast welcome (laughs) thank you David thank you Jasmine Hello everyone, my name is Tabata, and since we are doing decolonized introductions, 
I live in Pindorama. That's the ancestral name for what today we call Brazil. So it's a very beautiful indigenous land and with indigenous people living here until today with lots of knowledge. So as a student from plant medicine and from indigenous knowledge, I'm here to share a bit with you from my perspective. So uh, I love to navigate between worlds. So all the mystery life, oracles and spirituality, there are topics that I love most. And psychedelics came in, into my life like in a, for seven years now, and they helped me a lot to navigate between worlds and to know more and more about my existence. So as an existence and CK traveler, I'm also a psychologist. <laughs> I, I do this for my profession and officially, and I'm also a medicine woman facilitating retreats and ceremonies with plant medicine and trying to these bold techniques that merges academic knowledge with ancestral knowledge. And I hope I'll share a bit of that with you today. Beautiful. Thank you, Tabitha. And I love that you're talking there about kind of crossing worlds. And I think, yes, we're doing that geographically, different countries, different continents, but yeah, also different, I think, paradigms, different conceptualizations, different filters, different lenses, different realities that coexist. And I think we're going to be bringing them all into this uh, space to talk about. And as it's a vital psychedelic conversation, uh, there's one question we always ask at the beginning, and that is, what do you feel is a, a vital conversation that we should all be having right now in respect to psychedelics? So have a think about that. And you know, the, the two of you know each other well, I should say. So, so Jasmine's one of our instructors in Vital, um, and Tabitha is one of our students, and you are actually in the same study group. So you've been kind of holding space uh, together each week since April. Um, so there's so many important conversations that we should be having, I know. But could you tell us a bit, like, is there something really important that resonates with you? Maybe Jasmine could I ask you to go first. Yeah, wow, that's a, a really potent question. Um, yeah, thinking about it, I, I feel that just this concept of kind of epistemic injustice is one that I'd like to hone in on and the concept of epistemic humility and the term epistemic is a big one, but it has to do with, I guess, ontology, which is another big term, but also just, just ways of knowing and how we know what we know. Um, and so I think when we're talking about psychedelics, um, yeah, largely in the mainstream media and in this day and age that we exist in, um, I think there's a medicalization of psychedelics um, and they're really kind of honed in upon or honed in on for their ability to, you know, treat different mental health and behavioral disorders. And I think that there's so much more than that. And so I kind of like in my own praxis and my own being really want to engage in this, like zooming out this, um, like yes and instead of and or and I think that yeah there can be this medical paradigm that's happening in the west and that can be very beneficial and generative for many people but I think it can only be so if it is also beneficial to other communities especially indigenous communities where a lot of these medicines come from or originate and a lot of these practices originate and so um yeah, I think I think really giving those communities like, you know, epistemic integrity, like, you know, that giving their ways of knowing, um, I guess, yeah, credibility the same way that science has that credibility, um, you know, and I think that those ways of knowing also represent a science, but it is a very different science to our own. Um, 
and yeah, making space for both of these worldviews, but also without romanticizing one or the other. And I think that there's a lot of romanticization of indigenous cultures as well. And um, through that, there, there can be a, like an active erasure of those cultures, I think. Um, you know, like indigenous cultures have been evolving alongside like, you know, Western industrial, um, yeah, globalist culture. And so, you know, they're, they're not peoples who are stuck in time. And I think that the Western mind, a lot of people want to perceive those cultures as kind of like, oh, they, they kept something pure and we're going to go back to these people because they have this, I guess, like purity that they've maintained over time. It's like um, perpetuating this idea of the noble savage, you know? And I think that, yeah, I don't, yeah, indigenous people also are contemporary. And so I think it's really important to recognize that. I went to a ceremony, I don't know, last year and someone was really upset because one of the, the shamans, you could say, it's not a good translation of um, the term, but still, you know, one of the medicine men was also drinking while he was conducting a ceremony and they were like so upset by it. And, you know, it's just like what it was, if that made sense. And these cultures have problems. These cultures are evolving. Um, these cultures are influenced by yeah modern western industrialized globalist culture capitalism as well so i think i've said a lot there's a lot to pass out through through all of that but i guess those things have been on my mind so um i'll leave it there for the moment yeah jasmine this is clearly going to be a long podcast in that case thank you <laughs> that was some really yeah awesome uh multitudes of, of different topics and different branches that that go deep and they're really important for us to to talk about so yeah let's see where, where we can go with those i'd love us to try and cover them beautiful um tabata how about for you anything either the, the similar or, or different that, that kind of resonates for you as a vital conversation we should be having yes first i'd like to to ask for a little bit of patience because i'm recovering from a flu so for you of for those of you that will see this record on video, you will see that. Uh, but okay, let's talk of what is important. Heard in Jasmine and being able to learn from her in our vital study groups, there's a little bit of polemic topic. And I think it merges with what she was saying about who will be permitted to perform psychedelic therapy? It will be only physicians, only people from health, academic spaces, because what I like most in Vital is that is for everyone. Therapists, holistic therapists, coaches, people, who are willing, who want to study and help others and to understand all of these topics we are bringing here about decolonizing psychedelics, but also this blurry scenario we have opens the way for us to, to question who will be able to, to perform psychedelic therapy. And if we think about epistemic injustice, we only have like pure physicians and scientists being able to do this. And I don't think it's this way we, we have to see. So it's very nice we're having this conversation and be able to open these eyes for those who want to study about psychedelics in an ethic way, doing historical research as we do in Vito, and starting to think which future, which psychedelic future we are building now. Beautiful. I like that question. What psychedelic future are we building now? And 
which one do we want to build and what are we seeing being built around us? Um, maybe as a, as a bridging question, what concerns do we have about the way that the psychedelic industry, Renaissance, is bringing or could bring if, yeah, it's a, a corporate medicalized model? Why is that potentially a bad thing or why is that potentially not uh, comprehensive enough or inclusive enough? Yeah, well, there. I don't know. There's a massive list, you know, that I could I could name. I, I feel in my heart also all of these problems, not just you know a, a rational list, but I guess that one of them is just like these models. I guess I want to say tools for healing, but I think they're about much more than just healing um, themselves, but they're just being absorbed into a capitalist paradigm. And, you know, I, I, there was this beautiful talk by um, Geronimo Ma Masarasa, I think that's his name. I don't remember the name of the talk, but um, he was talking about like what happens when a culture is commodified or an element of culture becomes a commodity. And I think that that is kind of happening today just by virtue of the fact that that's what capitalism does in a sense you know it just like takes something that is culture and commodifies it or tries to um monetize it and so i think that's a really big issue that i see and yeah another issue kind of relates to access i think that you know these medicines have been stewarded by indigenous communities, by, you know, black, brown, indigenous people um, since time immemorial. And the way that the paradigm currently exists, um, you know, I, I forget, I, I remember reading some price point about some um, psychedelic center in Oregon. I forget what it was to have a single session, but it was, I think, something like two thousand dollars. And it's like it's actually, yeah, three thousand six hundred dollars. Three thousand. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that, David. Yeah. I mean it's it, it's a, to do these things legally, um, in many contexts, um has such a high price point and it kind of squeezes out or filters out the people um you know well BIPOC communities people from underserved communities that you know are are in need of arguably more healing um if we want to look at these substances as things to kind of um heal trauma um which is one lens that one can look at psychedelics through um but you know it, it, it filters out those people and bars them from access and i i you know think the underground is really important i think that underground healing is community healing but you know people who might want to seek out these substances in legal contexts the price point bars them from doing so and i think that yeah like this kind of medicalization of psychedelics really has to be accompanied by decriminalization of psychedelics so you know people that really want to use these substances are allowed to and they're allowed to do so without um, legal remits. You know, I don't think it's fair for one group, predominantly like white, wealthy, to profit off of these substances while other groups, you know, underserved communities are barred access from them. So that's another problem that I see. Yeah, I think I'll leave that there. Thanks, Jasmine. How about for you, Tabitha? What's coming up for you around this? Um, thinking about this medicalization of psychedelics, uh, a complicated part for me is to to have natural psychedelics that we call plant medicine, such ayahuasca, shrooms, and other psychedelics, just like they were a uh, pharma drug and sometimes microdosing or consuming in a way of bringing more uh, optimization from people for they to be able to be more fit in this 
uh, unwell society. <laughs> so when we see plant medicine, ancestral plant medicine in this big umbrella we call psychedelics is not the same as a synthetic psychedelic. So it's important to not use and to not think and to not talk about them as they were made in the lab. So in Brazil, we are listening more and more about this scientific approach, especially with ayahuasca, because ayahuasca is legal in Brazil, is part of our indigenous culture. From people, we are hearing that people from other countries want to take ayahuasca uh, for profit and to take this, take out ayahuasca from Brazil, from Amazonian cultures and to transform in pharma drugs. So that's very, very complicated because we are talking about, uh, again, of colonization of the plant medicine and to take plant medicine as it was like Prozac or Valium and they don't function like this and they don't work in our system like they this. They have spiritual uh, fields. They have spiritual content. There is not placebo effect. There is something valuable and we have to be paying attention from not over, over like, put in a scientific form. So we have to be careful not to overthink about plant medicine as they were a scientific thing, a scientific substance, because they are much more than that. Yeah, you, I really Tabitha. love, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, I really love what you were saying, Tabitha, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot myself, just this um yeah the medicalization of psychedelics and i know we've mentioned that before but it, it, in some sense it kind of absorbs these medicines into like a very kind of reductivist paradigm um and i think it's adam aronovich who has an amazing instagram meme account called healing from healing i really recommend it but he talks about traumadelic culture and the way that psychedelics have been kind of branded as substances that help you heal um yeah solely from trauma um or intergenerational trauma and while i believe that i also believe that there are so many other nuances as well like that more than that if that makes sense and you know like you're saying like these substances these plants aren't like prozac they aren't like um traditional um drugs um and so taking a substance um, depending on the context as well, invites in so much other types of meaning and meaning making. And as you were talking about spirituality and the mystical, there's a really beautiful conversation by, I think it was hosted by Harvard Divinity School a couple of years ago, and it's called Medicalizing Mysticism. And it was led by chaplains of different faiths um, in the psychedelic community that we're just talking about like this idea of um that, that there should like that there should be people um consciously kind of stewarding people through the spiritual element of these plants medicine substances um and that shouldn't be kind of squeezed out with the rest of it and i don't know they're, they're more than um their utility it's hard to kind of um yeah quantify the ineffable ineffable and i think inevitably scientific studies kind of do that right um if if you take 10 people with um treatment resistant um depression and you give them psilocybin ultimately unless it's a qualitative study but still ultimately they'll be answering some kind of questionnaire over a period of time and those like statistics will be looked at and quantified of, uh, and 
psilocybin then is kind of judged or deemed effective based on these statistics. Um, and I don't want to like, I don't know, throw away science or, you know, dismiss it in any way. Cause I think it has its place, but I think that like psilocybin or whatever substance plant it might be, you know, is much more than this, these reductivist measures that we can take about, well, make, um, and yeah, there's this really beautiful quote from that that conversation I mentioned about medicalizing mysticism. And I think it was Rachel Peterson that said, Gautama Buddha did not seek to attain enlightenment so that he could quit sp- smoking. Teresa de-, de Villa did not want to meet God so she could be more productive at a soul crushing job. God is not a self-help hack or as a recent popular psychedelic book put it, a cosmic surgeon who erases depression and anxiety. And I guess like the way that psychedelics are being kind of absorbed into mainstream culture almost reminds me of the way that mindfulness was in a sense. And there's this term like muck mindfulness. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's complex because you can't really necessarily only say it's bad because it's not. I think like this kind of mindfulness, mindfulness for productivity has really helped people um, find calm or maybe open themselves up to something deeper, deeper meaning in their lives. But I also think that it's kind of like, yeah, cherry picking in a sense and you miss the larger picture. Perfect. I was thinking about what Jasmine was saying. And this quote made me realize that that's it. We are not uh, using, even I don't use, I don't like the term use plant medicine. In Portuguese, we have synonyms. There are more uh, that, that brings this effective approach. But I will say use in English. So we don't use plant medicine to <laughs> to be more productive, or we we shouldn't think about plant medicine to be more productive, to be health healthy, so we can be integrated to this ill to this illness of productiveness. So it's a different time lapse. From it's a time lapse from nature. Nature is more calm. Nature has these cycles, like winter, summer, autumn. It's different. It's a time that brings us health. So, plant medicine and nature, they have a way to connect us with our essence because we are nature too. So we are taking a piece of nature to remember ourselves we are nature and as nature our healthy way to be in this world is not the capitalism so it's important to think about this timing even for healing when we talk about healing with plant medicine it doesn't happen as it happened in with pharma drugs as i said It's not this time, like in a month, you'll be healed. In a month, you'll have no symptoms. It's not like this. It works in mysterious ways. It has, each plant medicine has its personality, its spirit. It talks to you in different ways, not the way we want to. Because this society is like narcissism. I want to do that. I want to do that. I will take this drug to achieve that thing. That's not the way plant medicine works. That's not their engineer. It gives you what you need. And sometimes we don't know what we need. Plant medicine has different ways to heal us. Yeah, I'm going to jump in. I'm loving the conversation. Thank you. I'm asking myself, why is it like this? How did it get this way? Um, and why do we have such a limited, reductionist, superficial conceptualization of psychedelics, of healing, of life itself, of being a human being? And you know, Jasmine, you were talking a wee bit about ontological and epistemic you know, conceptualizations of 
you know, psychedelics and kind of meaning making and reality. And why is it that we've kind of cut out the mystery of life? And why do we struggle so much as a society, particularly in the West, you know, with mysterious spiritual realities of life that are maybe a little bit more undefinable and impossible to compartmentalize? And I think death itself, we struggle with that. And I think the, the compartmentalization of life and death is, is kind of fake. <laughs> yeah, they are real, but wow, they're just, they're, they're all just part of the great mystery of life and of existence. And I think our Western model and our reality that a lot of us live in has evolved into a you know, totally reductionist way of experiencing the average day the average breath of life, of seeing self and other, that strips us down from being spiritual in nature, from having energy in our bodies, from having a sense of sameness to each other. And, and it removes this possibility of there being a deep meaning to life in our planet, the universe, and belonging to nature as an animal. You know, we're top of this pyramid of the human being you know and particularly kind of you know white male patriarchal western norms of that as this top of the pyramid actually no we're actually destroying you know our our world and our society and culture and our own like, kind of psyche and spirit it's still there deep inside of us it, it's eternal and infinite we've just lost contact with it and we're scared i think of coming into contact with it so i guess i'm asking a question here why do you think we, we have become so distanced from our true nature? Why are we so scared and reluctant? And why is it so hard to reconnect with that essence um, that we all share as a human race, as a part of nature um, and yeah, the animal kingdom and the universe itself? David, you're asking very big questions here. One that, you know, a question that you could spend your life trying to like figure out. Um, and I guess what comes up for me is hyper individualism is one of the things that has led us astray. Um, this idea that, yeah, we have to, to be successful, we have to really, um, yeah go out on our own leave our families find success like climb climb a ladder and do it all independently i think is one one part of that another part for me is i guess there are different types of um yeah spiritual slash religious frameworks and yeah there is like in transpersonal psychology you talk about um like transcendent um religions and also imminent religions and maybe religion isn't the right word but i guess yeah frame like ways of knowing and um yeah world views um spiritualities and i think in the west largely but not only actually um you know there's a lot of like transcendent religions where god is some somewhere up here you know and we are down here on earth separate from god and i i don't think that that always results in like destruction of nature because like buddhism is also one of those kind of world views it's a transcendent um type of spirituality but i think that what we're looking for you know what we've lost in the west is kind of this or west slash global north is this enchantment with the world and we're kind of like going seeking these these cultures out that still have these very enchanted worldviews and seeking to re-enchant our own and i think that that also has to do with this kind of divinity transcend well yeah i won't use transcendent not to be confusing but yeah this this divinity this sacredness being imminent within matter itself you know like these um plants these um this body this soil the sun you know everything is sacred as opposed to sacredness being somewhere beyond and unattainable um and so yeah i think that we're 
you know, people are slowly kind of waking up to that, that, that imminent worldview. And um, I think it's a process, but yeah, a process of kind of Robin Wall Kimura talks about kinning as a verb, like, you know, kin as in family, kinship as in kinship ties and your relational ties and kinning as a verb. So, you know, just practicing that relationality um, with the rest of, I guess, yeah, nature, more than human beings, um, more than human people. And I think it's about finding that humanity outside of oneself. Um, yeah, I think there are many more things that I could talk about, but um, yeah, I feel complete. Okay, thank you, Jasmine. For me, an important point, <laughs> what David asked, yes, very big questions. We could spend like two, three days talking about all of that. But I think when human being started to to range each other for what people have and not what they are. That's a turning point. Because if I'm not important just for being myself, I have to prove with material things, with money, with academic achievement, with professional achievement, we will have like a importance scale between humans. Like, so the, the things that I'm better than you because I have more becomes real. And this is itself a community illness. Because when you go back to nature, there's not importance scale. All nature works in community. We have the importance of the tree and we have the importance of the insects that eat the tree and destroy the tree because the nature are, there's not good or better or worse or evil in nature. Nature simply are and all of the parts are important. So when human being remember that we are nature too. And I think psychedelics, plant medicine does this work very well. Like remember that we are part of the nature. We start to record that all human beings are a community. And we, are, we have shadow and we have lights. There's no such thing as more important or more pure or more good. We simply are. Yeah, I like the idea of competition, struggling with the concept of community and the focus on self. It really makes it harder, I think, to let others in and let ourselves to belong with others and for meaning to, to be derived from a sense of place, physical place and kind of, yeah, social, cultural place. Um, and I think if we can start to still look at it on a large level around without romanticizing by any means or generalizing looking at more indigenous and traditional cultures what are some of the experiences or some of the things that you've seen or, or heard about that can help people stay connected to that sense of the mysterious the divine to community being important to belonging to a culture, a tradition, to having a sense of the past and the future, having <laughs> a lot more importance than just now and me. What what have you seen, and what do you what do you know from what you've you've heard or witnessed um, that help people to maintain that connection and that awareness of life? Yeah, well, I. Yeah, without being an expert on any culture, you know, I don't want to speak for any culture, but things that I've witnessed that have impacted me um, is the honoring of the land and the honoring of the gods of the land. And I think that 
having a cosmo vision that is shared by all of the people around you which you know i'm i'm i don't think any anyone is like better or worse um you know because i we live in such a diverse world and um yeah i don't i don't necessarily i don't think that we should all have cosmo visions or spiritual views that align with one another but i think that integration of that cosmo vision between a group of people that sharing of values um really goes a long way and often that sharing of values you know spirituality is not separate from the land so i, I as i mentioned that you know the sacred being something I- imminent and i think that that is really present at least with the indigenous cultures that i've engaged with you know they make yearly pilgrimages to go and leave offerings in different places in the land they make sacrifices um animal sacrifices in this case to offer to the gods and you know i think that yeah it, at least yeah western culture writ large the cultures in the global north there is this kind of like idea well i don't know we do things for like the the pragmatism of them you know and it's kind of like you wouldn't necessarily plan a trip maybe some people would and i think a lot of people that i know are kind of doing this now to go leave offerings or to go on a pilgrimage to commune in a deep way um you know to because it's kind of a strange thing where it's like a, a practical action which is married with something ineffable you know and i think that yeah that there's just this disconnect between whatever it is that you know we we feel is sacred or is sacred um in many cases but i think that this reverence is displayed in a very um real and tangible way um whether it be leaving offerings of water or of like i said animal sacrifice and i'm not i'm not advocating for these things myself i'm not saying that I, you should all go out and do that but uh, it's just what i've witnessed it's like the idea and not the idea but the gods in these cultures are taken very seriously they are real beings and i think that this is where the kind of question of ontology and like epistemology comes into play because i think even as a westerner it gets hard to think about like the gods as real beings um you know and there's a sense of like oh but it's a gesture made to like a spirit that is believed in but not real and so i don't know there's yeah i i think those those concepts take to be embodied from someone outside of those cultures it it takes a lot of time spent with those cultures and a lot of time also yeah really decolonizing and unlearning as well because we've been taught to think of like spirits in particular um as something that is not real and so it's it's giving that way of knowing valence and um credibility by you know taking it for what it is described as if that makes sense yeah in a sense it, it could be quite an ontological shock for people having psychedelic experiences um you know to to have a very spiritual mystical experience yes but also something that just defines descriptions or being able to yeah box it in to our normal concepts of of life and of self of what how to make sense of it. it can be pretty scary like when you come into contact with spirits or gods or demons you know it, it's uh it's really hard um to understand that and it's very hard to dismiss it it really is i think that's why for me one of my concerns around you know psychedelics being medicalized is that in a sense we're dealing with spiritual experiences mystical divine experiences but if it's wrapped up in a medical kind of pill then people are, may not be prepared for what what experience they actually unleash within themselves that isn't medical it could have medical benefits but it's actually spiritual energetic emotional transpersonal um so how to prepare someone for that um and what kind of container and preparation and kind of holding space um to give people individually or as a group 
um, in order to, yeah, not in a sense shatter into a million pieces, to be able to kind of shatter to some extent, but not not completely. Um, so it brings me to the shamanic view of healing. And when I say shamanic, I think it's a it's a general term, but it's not only about the Brazilian indigenous ways. I think shamanic is an uh, I say shamanic as an ancestral point of view of healing of be of being in the world because when you when you see sacred in the ancestral way there there's no need to to be only about religion when you when you take off this this layer of religion from the world and the meaning of sacred you will understand that sacred is the river the trees as i said the ocean is sacred so when jasmine brings about uh animal sacrifices and these these ways of honoring god and honoring ancestrals we we cannot judge in the western way of seeing because it's different they they ask for permission they ask for the animal for permission they explain to the animal the the sacred function the animal will play in that particular ritual and they offer to mother nature and they eat the animal they don't like waste the animal it's not trash it's all part of a bigger of a, a, a macro view so when you see the river as sacred and you put the river is a god or goddess as many of the of the people like to see like the water as goddess so when you put an offer to the goddess river it's real for you you are putting your intentions your energy your time your effort there so i'm bringing this to you like as a as a turning point even for people that don't connect or don't know how to connect with the sacred with these experiences they have with plant medicine as you said like spiritual experiences sometimes a person doesn't have like previous historical relation with some religion or some experience with the the spiritual but there's no need to be afraid because nature is a reflection of what we are If you, we connect with demons, we have demons within. If we connect with God, with angel, with fairy, with the spirit of the tree, we have this inside us. There's no need to be afraid. So it's not it's schizophrenia. <laughs> it's, that's it. That's what David said. It's not clinical. It's much more. It's larger. It's, As Jasmine said, it's a different science. It's an ancestral science. Mm. Actually, Tabitha, maybe I can just ask you to whatever extent you're comfortable talking about your recent experience in the Amazon. I think last week, maybe. Um, yeah, anything there that kind of touches upon what, what you're talking about now and what, what the three of us are talking about at the moment. Yes, so the first thing comes to from my heart to my mind to share with you is their sense of community. We were about eight people coming into a village, a traditional village from the, the Shaninawa people, and they received us as we were part of the family. And it was for real. We could send... We, we could sense that. So when we congregate, when we are integrate people, they are not from your culture in that humble and lovely way. 
we start to rethink how we con congregate, how we integrate people from our own communities or urban communities. And we see that we have lots to learn, lots to go back and see about healthy relationships and community relationships and ways of healing that are not plant medicine that calls my called my attention as well. It plant medicine was one of the things that brought me healing there. We have three ayahuasca ceremonies, we have combo ceremony, but was not only that, everything that I saw, every conversation that I have with them was a part of my healing, of the healing I received there. So even that, not to mystify the indigenous community, they, they doesn't, their healing doesn't come only for plant medicine. It comes from daily basis. It comes from the way they, they work, they relate, they, they are connected on daily basis. That was one of the biggest learnings that I could connect in this trip to Amazon. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And the term integration is coming up, and that's a very Western term and how it's applied to psychedelics. But I'm also getting a feeling of harmony, like in this flow between plant medicine and life and culture and behaviors and thoughts and actions and feelings in the heart and the body and that's integration yeah but it's kind of harmony and kind of symbiosis or kind of being in relationship with each other like having a sense of all being interconnected we can call it integration but yeah it's very western but interconnection just seems super super important um as a reality to have and for me I, i'm recognizing it and you know I, I talk about my electrocution when i was 21 and how it affected me as a life-changing transpersonal ontological shock electrical shock as well but some of that was realizing that my identity was was just totally fake at the time when i was 21 but it was also very heavily culturally constructed and intergenerationally constructed and there wasn't much there about who i thought i was and and how i projected my sense of self that was authentic that had come from a place of deep knowing and loving myself that was connected to me and interconnected to others and, and life and, and and nature and i think that's a part of our our process of healing is realizing that we are interconnected and that a lot of our identity is is very much culturally constructed from a quite a sick culture and perhaps intergenerationally constructed from you know you know i think many many generations of more and more and more fragmented and superficialized realities of our ancestors at least for, for, for many of us um, and there's also a, a part of this that really speaks to the complexity of what we're trying to do right now I think with owning our individual shadow and our kind of collective shadow particularly when it comes to decolonization the complexity of owning the past and trying to bring in um, yeah diverse voices of being inclusive, of trying to have an interconnected kind of co-creation of a new reality that isn't full of shit and that isn't just kind of trying to look good and um, value signal to everyone that we're cool and doing the right thing, but that we are yet that we are actually part of something which is, yeah, in a sense, a new a new synthesis and and also at the same time a returning to an older way of being and existing that we've lost. And it's complicated to try to bring people together and to own that individual and collective shadow that we as human race have been part of and, and constructed. And I know Jasmine, that's something that you've been part of. You know, you've, you really kind of go there with some of these difficult conversations and difficult projects. Um, so maybe could we, perhaps for the last big subject explore this you know this complex conversation of deconstruction and decolonization and bringing in these diverse voices um, and how how we might 
start to move into that um, kind of new paradigm? Yeah, definitely. Well, I'd start by saying that I think a lot of us who are in this movement, this psychedelic community, plant medicine community, and maybe spiritual community more broadly, are like pursuing these things because we 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 feel that there's a need for a change in the world and we want to make a positive change. We want to do good or and, and create something um beautiful lean deep more deeply into our own humanity and i think that yeah i mean it, it's so hard to do that in this um capitalist consumerist world and how how do we maintain balance while living within a system and wanting to create a new one um or do away with that system entirely um you know in my own kind of activist work i'm really inspired by i don't know if you are familiar with um adrian marie brown but she is an amazing um community organizer writer podcaster and she published a book called emergent strategy and it it's a guidebook for activism in many ways but um i just really love this idea of um I guess the way that she defines emergence as kind of like small, um, yeah, small elements of a system that come together to make this overarching um, co complex system. And, you know, she really speaks about the importance um, and the value in these small, tiny gestures, acts, ways of being. And I, I think I really embody that within my own life my own philosophy i think that you know uh, and and i guess there's a fine line between like you know individualism and that kind of like more communal collaborative space um you know because it's not just like oh if i heal myself the world will be fine i don't believe that but i think that you know if 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 i beautify my life embody love on a small scale those actions will ripple out into the systems that i exist in so it's kind of like yeah and i, I really want to embody that in my you know community organizing my activist work my writing um my facilitation practice all of these kinds of things you know that these small gestures matter and I think the other thing that comes up for me is like listening and really attuning ourselves to others and what is happening. I think we learn so much when we are quiet and just observe and listen. And I think that when we want to do good, when we want to make change and help, um, you know, whether it's in, I guess, indigenous reciprocity movements or benefit sharing, all of these things, like when we want to give back um, and include, di well, diverse voices, other communities, I think listening is the first place to start. You know, I think in, in the West, we generally try to kind of start with action. And I think that we really need to just scale back. And another thing that Adrian Marie Brown talks about is moving at the speed of trust. And I, I really love that. And I think that that can apply to life on so many levels, whether it's in facilitation work or it's in activism, like just slowing down and attuning to the needs of the, the other, the person, the being um, that you're in relationship with um before taking any concrete action um yeah and the other thing is like you know we're all just humans trying to do good things uh, i'm giving everyone the benefit of the doubt i believe that you know i'm an optimist and i believe that people ultimately want to do the right thing or do do something good and loving ultimately and so you know i think it's also just allowing space for mistakes to be made because people will make mistakes in whatever kind of work they're trying to do and yeah just just being patient with those mistakes being understanding um allowing people to take accountability and allowing for reparation and forgiveness to take place um i've been thinking about this a lot in the context of yeah just social justice and i think that this idea of healing justice and 
restorative justice is so important um, because, yeah, I, I, I think that if we really want to make change, like that change is going to be messy and people are going to make mistakes. So um, I think we all just need to be compassionate with one another and open to critique as well. Um, yeah, allowing for other other insights to kind of penetrate your your internal bubble I guess because I think it's really helpful to have feedback from outside and something I also learned and this was more in in the context of writing an article about um I guess the the threats to peyote um something that I learned was you know I was trying to like find who the bad guys were so to speak and yeah I learned that there is really no no bad guys so to speak um yeah but there's like people with different needs taking different actions to meet those needs and those actions might have negative consequences and they might come from all these different I don't know angles and so I think it's also just important to just kind of take down these fingers pointing and criticizing from different sides and really trying to engage in dialogue and understand other perspectives beautiful there was so much there jasmine thank you yeah i love the piece around activism that's that, that seems like an important word for us to to kind of bring back and 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 i think frame some of what we're doing it, this is pretty radical um somewhat revolutionary almost um or at the very least uh, evolutionary with with our activism, um, particularly restorative justice, and I'm sense I've seen quite a lot the the role of money, and in a sense writing a check, to say, oh, okay, here's some money, uh, everything's okay now, or here's some money, fix the problem, and here's let me tell you what the problem is, <laughs> and let me also tell you what I think the solution should be, <laughs> and here's the money, go please do that, and you know, and then I'll be involved in benefiting from that new solution or at least the, the publicity from it and the role of money it's it's somewhat toxic but it can do good but it's very hard i think just to deploy money as an asset um, to do good um, and for it to really have a kind of benefit and to be to have the correct ownership um, when there is money involved particularly just around the question of what's the problem and who gets to define the problem and what's the solution and who gets to define the solution and i think that applies to everything around kind of world peace and environmental destruction you know and you know psychedelic ownership and um you know plant medicine stewardship as well but yeah just that piece jasmine i don't know if there's anything around like who, who's defining the problem and the solution and, and the value of, uh, and the role of money and it's very very precarious um anything around that 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 kind of other than what you've just said already that kind of that, that guides how to go through that process of of yeah listening and taking it slowly this kind of uh, process yeah i think it's generally hard when money's involved just because you know by virtue of giving money like you want to see some kind of like tangible result in a sense like there's there's like a change that's wanting to be seen from giving that money and usually you know not all the time but usually it's organizations from the global north that are giving money to the global south and like i said i think that deep listening is important and i think that like letting those communities lead is also important um you know letting them define you know help without consent is yeah i don't know it's not really help it, it's not helpful rather um, and so I think that, yeah, this deep listening also has to do with spending time building relationships and, um, yeah, building trust. Um, and I think that the, those things take years sometimes. Um, and so I think that, yeah, just the way, and I'm thinking about the psychedelic community, you know, just the, and, culture writ large is like things move on such a fast scale you know you want to see a project take off the ground within a year or two but maybe just building a relationship takes that time you know and yeah I think that there are also yeah just 
different countries have different systems, different ways of working. Um, tribal governance is also a very complicated thing that, you know, I don't really understand. And I think that, yeah, it, it's, it's really hard, I guess, when you're talking about working with indigenous communities, because there might be like, I don't know, yeah, there might be like five different communities um, of Widadaka peoples. And so like, who do you get permission from? All of them? Are they in um, conflict with each other? Do they have disagreements between communities? So it's really hard to, I don't know, get that consent and then use that consent in a, what I'm trying to say, it's, it's a very like nuanced thing and it takes time. It takes, and, and you know, not everyone can afford that time either, right? To go spend time in another country or hire people in another country to build those relationships. So I don't know, these are all very delicate matters. And yeah, I think, I think they just, it requires a lot of deep care and I think that so many people are very well intentioned um, and you know without understanding the nuances necessarily I include myself in that camp also you know you know wanting to do good and being clumsy with it sometimes yeah but not giving up as well like not becoming hardened mm -hmm. and running away from it still listening and going slow and I love what you said there because it's like um, as above so below and on an individual level we're taking a, a pill a psychedelic or ayahuasca brew thinking ah oh, heal me like I want to be you know fixed or more efficient and effective and I think on a meta level bigger level here's some money go fix this problem quick like simple but actually no both of those the individual healing journey and, and the collective cultural societal journey takes time to build a relationship like relationship with myself like getting to know oneself that is an essential part of, of i think it should be a prerequisite before using psychedelics is to do some deep introspection and, and healing work before even thinking about you know popping some psychedelic pill or plant um, and so societally, culturally, that kind of restorative conversation and sitting with each other. Yeah, it's the same same kind of process, just on the meta level. So, yeah, love it. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, Tabata, any, any kind of closing thought around this conversation piece that, that you're thinking about? It's a lot to process because as we were talking before this record, this talk about restore this this honor this respect for indigenous people for the ancestors it will be messy like jasmine said there's no guidebook like this is the perfect situation to do restorative uh, restorative uh, conversations or restorative actions with indigenous people even because they need different things so what you both were saying about listening for me is so important and for us there are not indigenous trying to build this relationship is the humidity to know that we can't help everyone. Unfortunately, we will be able to do our best. And sometimes we'll, won't be enough because it's a, a world problem like for many years now. So to keep this in mind helps us to, to balance. I put myself in that because sometimes I do my best and I feel that it's not enough, but it's a, it's a global problem. It's a whole community problem. So to understand that we are not the saviors is also decolonized all, all this, this restoration. I don't think that's a word in English, but to, to restore this 
this relationship, maybe. And in Portuguese, we have a, a saying that in English would be like doing an ant's work, like step by step, small steps, and do for your community with con constantly. And sometimes you won't see the result of that. But you should keep doing because, as I said, we are building this psychedelic future now. So sometimes we will be messy, we'll be clumsy, we'll make mistakes, and sometimes we will help, but we are planting seeds. What is that expression in, uh, in Portuguese, Tabata? How does it say? Trabalho de formiga. And work like day by day, small steps, everyone together, <laughs> bringing that big leaf for for your cave to everyone to eat, <laughs> everyone to eat that. It's not my leaf. <laughs> <laughs> this is my leaf. <laughs> it's everyone's <laughs> leaf. It's a big leaf that we need yeah. all together to bring it, and will be small steps and steps. Beautiful. And, and I think that really sums up quite a bit of what we're talking about. Like we're, we're not just talking about our lifetime um, or my country or my people. We're talking, you know, to, to some extent it is pretty much, you know, intergenerational into the future and, and truly global. Like I think a lot of the problems and the solutions that we have, as well as being local, they are also very much global right now. So, yeah. Before we sign off, just any quick um, feelings that you wanted to share or thoughts or beliefs or points that, that resonate that we didn't get a chance just to share briefly, either of you or both of you? Well, first of all, what was coming up for me after what Tabata shared was just this um, this sentiment from the Bhagavad Gita in which, you know, Krishna is having a, a conversation with Arjuna and, you know, he says that like act not for the fruit of your actions. Like that shouldn't be the motivator of why you act, you know? And so it should be about the doing itself rather than the the fruit or the the benefit of doing in the long term. Um and I guess that that really comes up for me. And I also think just just this idea of community interconnection, um living within a broken fragmented system you know I, we talk about a lot about healing and healing doesn't happen in a vacuum i feel um you know it's really relational systemic like and i think that yeah really i, I don't even know if i like the, the term healing because i think it's like one thing that we're doing with these medicines or with any kind of I don't know growth internally um or ex you know in our in our physical world also I think you know healing and maybe holding like becoming more whole people because I think that's what it is for me as well it's like I'm I'm growing into whoever I am or need to be in, in this time that we live in and you know I, I think that yeah that I what gives me a lot of hope or motivation is just thinking about, as you were saying, like future generations. And I think that for me, that's also why I feel like motivated to do this healing, holding um, growth work. And yeah, I think that that's why this conversation is especially potent to me. Um, you know, we're bridging pathways to build new futures um, and yeah new ways of being for ourselves and future generations because this mode that we've been stuck in really is not supporting life on the planet and yeah it's, it's very real when you think about like life on the planet like we're we're in a you know precarious situation as a species and so i think that that you know the larger conversation about healing trauma spirituality all comes back to that for me it's like, well, what are, what are we doing as a species? Like, where are we going? And um, I think these plants are just one of many ways to reconnect us with this larger wholeness. Beautiful. Thank you, Jasmine. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Tabitha, anything for you that you want to emphasize? 
Uh, I couldn't leave this conversation without thank you both and thank you this opportunity because I think I'm one of the, the first Brazilians in Vital. I already searched where in our, our Vital community, many of the Brazilians are not living in Brazil. Many of the Brazilian students are not living in Brazil for many years now. So I can bring all this knowledge we are building and I'm learning to my country. And that for me is amazing because the psychedelic community in Brazil is still taking baby steps. Yes, in English you say baby steps. It's like ants work. We are still taking baby steps. So to, to be able to build here, to help building here this psychedelic future, I'm learning a lot from you. And to have a conversation here in Brazil, it's 9 a.m., almost 10 a.m. With you, there are in two different sides of the world. For me, it's amazing. It's technology using, use it in the right way. So thank you, you. Thank you, Vital. And let's have more conversations like that. <laughs> thank you, Tabitha. Yeah, it's cool to think that what we're doing now, the three of us, is, is kind of part of this, yeah, interconnectivity and intersectionality kind of and restoring uh, globally, you know, some of these different conversations that we're having and that both you're, you're giving a lot to Vital, especially through this podcast, and in, you know, with your study, group, but also gaining a lot and bringing it back to Brazil from yeah, what you're learning, Vital. It's, it's so cool. And we've got another student in Thailand as well, um, Nick. I'm not sure if you've met him, and he's giving a lot and gain and just taking it back to Thailand. And it's, 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 yeah, these are some of the conversations, yeah, we all need to be having. Um, if anyone who is listening would like to, yeah, connect with you or learn more about your work, some of the projects you're involved with, um, could you direct them to how they would find? out more please uh, Jasmine perhaps if you want to uh, tell folks first yeah website coming soon but my my instagram handle is j a double z um dot v i r d i i'm generally pretty responsive on there and tend to post all of my writing and other work on there so you can find me there for now all right, thank you, yeah, Jazz. And yeah, website coming soon. I need to do one of those myself as well. It's just, <laughs> I've been meaning to do that for about a decade now. I've just never bloody done it. I've bought multiple ones and never did a thing with them. So yes, let's let, maybe we can help each other do that. Seriously, like set a, set a goal and a deadline and say, okay, let's do it. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> uh, right. You heard it here first. All right. And, and Tabitha, um, yeah, where would you direct people to? I'm one of those with website coming soon as well because i'm getting involved <laughs> in so much uh, outside from brazil so i need to think about a translation as well for my website but for now my instagram is my name as you will say we'll see on the the title of this podcast tabata Gurk. And you can use the translation button from Instagram to read about the things I wrote and to connect with me. You can send me DMs and I'll be happy to talk with you. Beautiful. So it sounds like we've actually got three websites coming and for Tabata, both Portuguese and English translation. So awesome. Let, yeah, let's do it. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Jasmine Verdi and, and Tabitha Gurk. This is lovely. Really awesome having this conversation. So, yeah, blessings to you both. And, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, all right. Take care, both of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks, Tabitha. Bye, guys. Thank you. God bless everyone. All the best. Bye.